Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, first talk of the third edition of the Legacy of Socrates. Um, I'm really happy to introduce you to Barney Diller. If you don't know Barney, he is a software team lead at Canon Medical in Edinburgh. Uh, he has been writing software uh, professionally for 25 years now, and he is really passionate about software crafting, testing, continuous learning. Um, I know that because I virtually met Barney uh, because we're in the same Slack groups, which are Software Crafters uh, and Legacy Cub Rocks, uh, which I will mention later in this conference. Uh, but the, the, the world is small after all, and uh, we, we're sharing the same communities. And so I, I had the occasion to, to meet Barney and to, to see his talks. Uh, so I'm really happy that he's here today to, to present you the Gilded Rose Kata. If you don't know the Gilded Rose Kata, it's a coding exercise uh, that is meant for you to practice refactoring existing code. And to do so, uh, you have a couple of techniques and Barney is gonna show you some of the techniques you can use when you are addressing existing code. Um, and I invite you to, to watch this talk and to practice the, this uh, coding kata afterwards at home uh, or at work, because I think it's a very good, very good exercise to practice these skills. As developers, we tend to spend a lot of time performing, like working at work, and not enough time practicing these uh, techniques. Uh, and practicing makes performing easier. So, Barney, up to you. Uh, you can start presenting. Thank you. Let me just start my timer. There we go. Hello there. Uh, yeah, I'm Barney Della. Um, and uh, as was just said, I'm a software team lead at Canon Medical uh, here in Edinburgh. And I'm going to talk to you today about deliberate practice, about improving your skills using catters, about tooling, testing, and continuous learning. Um, one caveat is all of the code in this talk is in C++. Uh, but hopefully it's, it's understandable, even if you don't know the language that well. So a couple of years ago, I had the great pleasure of bringing Amitai Schleyer into my work for a week. Amitai is a technical agile coach, and it was great to have him on my team for a few days. And one thing that he really pushed was the idea of having a learning hour, that every day you do some deliberate practice. And practicing your skills is very common in lots of fields. Um, people go out jogging or they do yoga. Musicians regularly practice sample pieces or scales, and martial artists perform set pieces called katas. But for some reason, it's not so common in the world of software. Uh, kata is a Japanese word, and it's used to describe a martial arts practice that is regular, repetitive, and choreographed. And in software, of course, we love to borrow words from Japanese, so exercises to practice in the art of writing software are also known as katas. Although, because software is complex and changing, our practices tend to be less regular and less repetitive. There is a great collection of katas online if you want to look for them. So on my team, after Amatai's visit, we started doing regular katas. And we did these using mob programming, which is a practice that we use a lot in general. And in these learning sessions, we practiced test-driven development. We tried various katas we found online. And we had to go at learning other languages like Haskell. And we didn't do this just because it's fun although learning together is fun. We did it to become better at what we do, to make our everyday work a bit easier, to go that bit faster. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you now about one kata in particular that we spent a lot of time on. Some katas you can do in half an hour or less, but we spent weeks on this one kata and we learned some interesting things along the way. I'm gonna share some of that with you now and I'm gonna talk about that kata, how we got to grips with it using approval testing and then code coverage tools how we refactored it, how we added new unit tests, how we made those expressive, and finally a look at mocks and stubs. But I'm gonna back up a bit first. I went to an excellent talk at CPP on C last year by Claire McRae on quickly testing legacy code. And she talked about the approval test library, which she helped port into C++. And I thought it'd be great to try and practice this library. Um, I work on a lot of legacy code, as I'm assuming all of you do as well. And I'm always keen to try out new tools and practices that can help me. So I looked for a kata that we could use um, as a way of exploring this approval testing library. But as we explored this kata, we ended up going much further than just the approval testing. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about. So this cutter that we spent so long on is called the Gilded Rose. With most cutters, you start from nothing. You have an empty project and you have to implement some tricky function or other. And these can be great for practicing specific skills, but they're not representative of how we normally work. But the Gilded Rose is different. This cutter is designed to mimic a real legacy code base. You've got a readme, some code, including one class that you can modify, and some unit tests. The CATA was originally created by Terry Hughes and written in C-sharp. But since then, Emily Bates has gone on to translate it into more than 40 languages. This is a list of all of the languages available from Emily's GitHub. There are quite a few of them, and a few more, and a few more. There's everything here from Perl to Haskell to XSLT to C++. Now, the code for the function that you have to modify uh, is only a few tens of lines long but it's been deliberately designed to be convoluted, entangled, confusing, and unhelpful. There's documentation and there's tests, but just as in real code bases, these can't be trusted. The only thing you're told is that the code is currently being used in, this, in a live system. So you should know that it works and that whatever it's doing right now, you want it to keep doing the same thing. Your job is then to add some new functionality to this function. So it'd be great if we had some tests to make sure that we don't break anything. This function uh, is what you can see here. And if you look at the indentation of this function, we can tell that it's a mess just from looking at that red line there, really, just by scanning it. It's full of branching based on conditionals. I'll go through the function in a bit of detail just so we can see what we're up against. So there's a method on the Gilded Rose class called update quality. Um, and it loops through uh, the items that we have here. So we're looping through the items and then for each item, if it's not aged Brie and it's not a backstage pass, then if the quality is above zero and the item isn't sulfurous, hand of Ragnaros, then we reduce the quality by one. Right, that's the end of the first if clause. Else, so that means it is aged Brie or a backstage pass. And if the quality is less than 50, then we increase the quality by one. If it's a backstage pass and the cell is less than 11 and the quality is still less than 50, then we increase the quality by another one. If the cell is less than six and the quality is still less than 50, then we increase the quality by another one. Okay, a top level if. If the item isn't the sulfurous hand of Ragnaros, then we decrease the cell in by one. If the cell is less than zero and it's not age free and it's not a backstage pass and the quality is greater than zero and the item is not the sulfurous hand of Ragnaros, we decrease the quality by one. Else, so the item is a backstage pass, then we make the quality equal to the quality minus itself. Else, so if the item is aged free, and if the quality is less than 50, then we increase the quality by one. Now, I don't know about you, but I got lost on that pretty much immediately. Quality and selling were being modified, but it's far from obvious how they're being modified. Let's try the readme instead. Hi, and welcome to Team Gilded Rose. As you know, we are a small inn with a prime location in a prominent city by a friendly innkeeper named Allison. We also buy and sell only the finest goods. Unfortunately, our goods are constantly degrading in quality as they approach sell by date. We have a system in place uh, that updates our inventory for us. It was developed by a no nonsense type named Leroy, who has moved on to new adventures. Your task is to add the new feature to our system so that we can begin selling a new category of items. First, an introduction to our system. All items have a sell in, which denotes the number of days we have to sell the item. All items have a quality value, which denotes how valuable the item is. At the end of each day, our system lowers both values for every item. Pretty simple, right? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Once the sell-by date has passed, quality degrades twice as fast. The quality of an item is never negative. Aged Brie actually increases in quality the older it gets. The quality of an item is never more than 50. Sulfurous, being a legendary item, never has to be sold or decreases in quality. Backstage passes, like aged Brie, increases in quality as its sell-in value approaches. Quality increases by two when there are 10 days or less, and by three when there are five days or less, but quality drops to zero after the concert. We have recently signed a supplier of conjured items. This requires an update to our system. Conjured items degrade in quality twice as fast as normal items. Feel free to make any changes to the update quality method and add any new code, as long as everything still works correctly. However, do not alter the item class or items property as those belong to the goblin in the corner who will insta rage and one shot you as he doesn't believe in shared code ownership. You can make the update quality method and items property static if you like, we'll cover for you. 
Just for clarification, an item can never have its quality increase above 50. However, sulfurous is a legendary item, and as such, its quality is 80, and it never alters. OK, so we have a running live system, and our job is to update it to support conjured items. And conjured items lose quality twice as fast as normal ones. But we need to do this without changing the existing behavior. But we don't understand the existing behavior. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't feel confident that I could modify the update quality method to support that new behavior just now. So maybe there are tests in place that will help us. There are, in fact, two unit test files. This is the first test file. It has a main function that prints out the result of running update quality on some inputs 30 times. It doesn't actually test anything or assert anything, but we can run it, and it does indeed print out some values to the console. OK. This is the second test file. This does have a test that runs. It makes sure that when an item called foo is, update, is updated, it ends up with the name fix me, and this test fails. There's also a function called example, which is never called. So clearly this code is not under test. And this is a problem because we need to modify the code without changing the existing behavior. But we have no tests to verify the existing behavior. This is where approval testing can help. <clears throat> approval testing is designed to help you when you have a system that repeatedly gives consistent output given consistent inputs. They are a way of performing golden master testing. You create an ideal state, you commit it, and then verify that subsequent runs of the test produce the same result. The golden master can be an image, a log file, a stream of text, anything really. As long as you can compare two versions of the object and store it in version control, you're good. So if we're going to use approval testing, we need some consistent inputs that produce some consistent outputs. In our case, we do have that main function that prints out the results for a collection of inputs by updating them every day for 30 days. And if we run this function a few times, we can see that the results are the same every time. We could store this output in a file, say, and then every time we make changes to the code, we could check the outputs of the latest run against the one in the file and make sure they haven't changed. Approval testing does almost all of this for us. <clears throat> so we can turn this function into an approval test fairly simply um, once we have a test framework in place. So first of all, I've just extracted here a little helper. This is the helper that created the items. Um, and it's just a little uh, collection of items that goes in here and then gets returned, just to make the next function a little bit easier to understand. So then instead of writing our output to C out, which in C++ is a way of writing to the console, we're going to use a string stream. This is just an in-memory um, string. So we then ask approval tests to verify the string for us. That's down here. And that's it, we're done. We now have a test in place. So what happens when we run this test? The test framework comes along and it runs this approving test function. It does this little loop filling up the string stream and then it hits its approval line. Uh, and at that point, it tries to compare the result of that string with something. But at the moment, there's nothing to compare it to. But luckily, the framework expects this, and it pops up a diff tool for us. In my case, it just magically found WinMerge. On the left is the new output we've just generated, and on the right is nothing. So all that we need to do is copy over the output to the right and save and exit. The test run then finishes, and the golden master output is stored in the text file. Now this first run actually fails because it failed this match here. We had something here, but nothing here. But if we run it again, then it does pass and it passes silently with no output, uh, no prompting of WinMerge. And the framework even chooses a nice name for the file for us, which is rather nice. And the output is something like this, and it obviously goes on for 30 days, not just the two we see here. And if we run the test again and again, they pass with no prompt because the output is identical every time. But if we change the behavior and rerun the tests, then the system detects that difference and it prompts us with the change in WinMerge. So now that we've got that text file, we can commit it um, and then live alongside our code and be run from now on. So great, we have some tests running and they're committed. But how do we know if the test is comprehensive? The inputs were just the random strings that we found in that unused main function. We can tell that some code is being invoked because the values in the output change from day to day as we go through that for loop. But are the tests covering all of the production code? To find that out, we need a code coverage tool. On my team, we normally use Bullseye, which is a C++ framework to check our code coverage. It integrates very nicely into Visual Studio. So we can turn on Bullseye, rebuild, run our tests, and then look at the output. 
and we can see here uh, we get 100% coverage in our update quality method. Um, so that's good because this test was just one that we found lying around and the inputs were just some random things. We haven't really thought about them yet. So it's nothing to double check that the results are good. So imagine if we commented out the aged Brie here um, and ran our tests again to see what our coverage is. And with that, we can see that we're only getting 86% uh, coverage through our update quality. Um, so if we revert that and put it back, then we do indeed have 100% coverage. Um, now, full code coverage is a good thing, but it doesn't really tell you that your tests are any good. It just tells you that they might be good. A test that invoked every line of our function, but then just asserted true, would have full code coverage, but be of no value whatsoever. But in our case, we can see that the full state of each item is being printed out and that they're changing as we call update quality. Uh, this line here is different to this line here. So we know that the output is being checked to make sure that it doesn't change. And we can be fairly confident that we have a good test harness in place once we've got all this. So with that, I think we can move on. But the code, of course, is still in a mess. We have a test harness, but we have messy code. And we need to add new functionality. So first, we're going to tidy up the existing code. If we change the behavior, then hopefully our approval test will tell us. But refactoring is also a great way of learning about a piece of code. I've got the quote here from Kent Beck. Uh, for each desired change, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard. And then make the easy change. That's very good advice. So the goal of refactoring is to change the structure of the code, the shape of the code, without changing the behavior. With refactoring, it's really important to take small steps. And we do this by making small changes, running the tests, and then committing if the tests pass. And changes that make the tests fail can just be reverted. So the first step we can take is to remove one of the two test files. Um, we've made one of our test files work for our approval tests, and the other one was just broken with an unused function, so we can just delete that. Once we've done that, we can look at our update quality method. Most of the changes that we're going to make are going to be either extract variable or extract method. These are standard refactorings where you pull out a complex expression and give it a name, or you pull out a complex piece of logic and give it a name. Okay, onto the refactoring. As an example of extracting variable, there's a few places in the function that check if the item name is not sulfurous hand of Ragnaros. If the item's name is not sulfurous hand of Ragnaros. And we can easily introduce a variable and use that every time instead. So here, uh, instead of this, we now have a Boolean defined here and we use that. But it's worth noting that this also makes the if statement much easier to read and easier to understand. We've raised the level of abstraction away from comparing the name of the if item against a string to looking at what kind of item this is. We've given a good name to what was just an anonymous expression before. And of course, now we can run our tests, make sure they still pass, <clears throat> and then commit. Now, this kind of refactoring is a really easy way to start exploring complex legacy code. Each change makes the code a little bit easier to understand. But each change also gives us a way of walking through the code to help us build up a mental model of it as we go. And as we build up that mental model, more and more complex changes become more and more obvious. As an example of extract method, this code here pops up a few times in the update quality method. And looking at it straight off, it's not immediately obvious what it's doing. But we can move that code into a helper function. We can then tidy it a bit and call it instead. So before it was setting the, it the items quality to be the items quality plus one, well, we can just increment instead. Um, and now we just call this instead, which tells us exactly what's happening. We're incrementing the quality of an item. So again, we've raised the level of abstraction of the code. And after a few iterations of this, we get onto something that we can see on the screen here. We've extracted out some useful helper functions, each of which is small enough to understand. Some of the helpers that we created were a bit more complex, like this one here but it's still possible to reason about it. It's only got um, a small bit of branching. If we're not expired, we return. Um, we work out a couple of Booleans to do with what type of item it is. Then we do different things based on those items, relatively straightforward. But the end result is that our actual update quality method is now very easy to understand. This is it now after all that refactoring. All we do is we iterate over each item. We skip sulfurous items. We then update the quality and decorate the selling. And then we update the quality for expired items. Done.
It turns out that's what the original 50 line function was doing. Here is the original version. Um, we were able to make these changes because we had the approval test harness in place. And I hope you agree that this is indeed much more understandable. The functions are much smaller. There are no craziness conditionals and the code has been modernized a bit. If you want to see a masterclass in refactoring this kata, but I've included a link at the end to Sandy Metz solving it in Ruby. Um, but either way, our code is now understandable enough for us to try and implement the new requirement. <coughs> so here is that new requirement again. Um, conjured items degrade in quality twice as fast as normal ones. So we need to support conjured items, whatever they are. Approval test that we have, there is a hint in there. It looks like somebody in the past thought that you should just define a conjured item by starting the name with conjured. So we can work with that. This is a conjured item and this should degrade quality twice as fast as it does at the moment. So for the new requirement, we'll use TDD. As I mentioned before, cutters such as this are a great way of practicing these kind of skills if you don't do them in your day job. The idea is you add a small requirement in the form of a test and then implement just enough code to satisfy that requirement. So each unit test should be just a few lines long. It's good practice to break these up into three blocks, arrange, act, assert, or given, when, then. First, we arrange things. Uh, and in the test framework that we have, we have this nice require macro, uh, and this will halt if things haven't been set up properly. Um, so if this, this here is a Boolean, um, a predicate, and if it fails, then we don't go any further. Then we act, and this should be a single action for a single test. When we do this, then we expect our assertion to pass. It's nice if there's a single assertion, but you can have more than one. And in our test framework, we have this check macro, it will not halt the execution if it fails, although it will fail the test. And this means that you can have multiple checks at the end and you'll be able to see the results of all of them, uh, even if the first one fails. And it's good practice to use just two blank lines to break up the test. If you need more blank lines, your test is probably too complex and should be broken up. And it's also good practice not to over constrain the assertion. If you're testing that something should log, then just test that it logs. Don't test the exact log message. Overly strict tests prevent you from changing the code later. Okay, so this is the first test that we wrote. Um, it's to detect whether something is not conjured. Uh, we don't really have an action here. We just have an item which is not conjured and we have a function that we want to make sure returns false when we pass it in. This fails at first because we haven't actually written this function yet. <coughs> so now we've got our function is conjured and it just returns false. The test pass so we can commit and move on. Now we have another test to detect that a conjured thing is conjured. We have our conjured mana cake that we found. We want to pass it in and make sure that this returns true. So this now forces us to do something more clever in our implementation. This is known as triangulation in TDD. You had a test that forces some change in direction in your code. So now instead of just returning false, we now look at the initial um, part of the stream that's passed in, and if it's conjured, we return true. With that, our test pass, so we can move on to our next test. Now let's look at quality. We can start by testing our assumptions about the current behavior. We expect non-conjured items that have not expired to decrease in quality by one per day. So we write a test here to capture that uh, expectation. I mean, we think that will pass. So here we have uh, initial quality of six. We expect it to go down by one. Um, we pass in our thing, we update it in update quality, and then we check it. This does indeed pass, which is good because it means our expectation, our assumptions do indeed match reality. So we can move on to our real requirement finally, which is that conjured items degrade in quality twice as fast. Here, we're passing in some conjured mana cake. We're starting with a quality of six. We think it will go down by two to four. And as expected, this test fails right now because we haven't actually written the code to make it pass. But here's our existing decrement quality function. This just takes in an item and decrements the quality by one. And it's not too hard to modify this to make our new is conjured function, uh, to make use of our new is conjured function. So now we detect, first of all, if we have a conjured item. If we do, then we decrement the quality a second time. And that makes our test pass. Ah, it means our unit tests pass, but our approval tests now fail. Because of course the conjured mana cake is now losing quality at twice the speed. So now we're getting different output. So here are the changes in the output that we're seeing. 
Um, Conjure Manica used to start with a quality of six, which went down by five, then four, then three. Now it's going from six to four to two. Well, that's what we expected would happen when we uh, in introduced this new feature. So we can mark this as the new approved version and commit it. This is now our new gold standard. One thing though about this decrement quality function is that we can see we're now decrementing twice if it's conjured. This is fine if the quality is large enough or if it's even, but what if the quality of a conjured item starts at one? We'll decrement it once and then once again, then the quality will be below zero. And we have a requirement that that should never happen. So we can add a test. Uh, quality of conjured items does not go below zero. We start with a quality of one. We expect the quality to go down to zero, but no lower. This test fails. So we can make it pass now by checking the quality um, again before we decrement it. So if it's above zero, we decrement it. Check again if it's above zero and if it is, decrement it again. Uh, this is ugly, but at least it makes the test pass. Um, we can now refactor it if we need to, but everything passes now. So we've pretty much solved the original cutter here, but it's always good to leave code in a good state for the next person to come across it. Um, that's what we're practicing. We're practicing the idea of working on a legacy code system. So you should always leave things in a cleaner state than you found them. And the main thing that's missing at the moment is comprehensive unit tests. So we should add them and refactor them as we go. We want to make our unit tests expressive with as few magic numbers as possible. Let's look at an example. We have this increment quality method, um, which should never increment the quality if it's more than 50. So we have some interesting edge cases to think about. Obviously any quality below 50 should get incremented. So three should go to four, 10 should go to 11, and 49 should go to 50. But 50 should stay at the same value and so should anything above 50. The function works on integers, so we should make sure that it copes well with the extreme values like the min and max integer values. In other words, we're really interested in the few values around 50, which is our edge case. Um, we're going to call this function generally for things with a quality between 0 and 50. So we're, very, we're a little bit interested in this range here. Um, 0 is sometimes an interesting edge case. We don't really care much about this bit here or this bit here. But we do care a little bit about making sure it doesn't crash or anything with the mint in, uh, uh, min int and max int. So initially we wrote tests for zero, for one, for 49, 50, 51, and for the numerical limits. But it's very verbose and there's lots of duplication in the test as you can see. Um, these are pretty much exactly the same apart from these numbers here. So the intent behind the test has become lost in the noise of all these repeated tests. And we've also got these horrible hard-coded arbitrary numbers. Someone who reads this might think there's something special about eight and nine or 1,012, but these were really just chosen because this is a standard number that you might call it with, and this is one outside of the range. But although they were chosen arbitrarily, they've now been hard-coded. They've become very specific numbers. So we found this nice feature of the um, test framework we use called generators. And these allow us to specify a list of values and to run the tests for all the values in this list. So with this here, we're generating this test case here for the minimum numerical limit for zero and for 49. But you can actually go even further. You can specify a range, you can ask for random numbers from a range and you can apply filters. So this last one here is taking five random odd numbers between minus 100 and 100 and it'll run the test case for all of those five numbers. So this is what we ended up with. Um, this is our test that quality increments when it's 49 or less. <coughs> we take the minimum integer, we take 100 random numbers between that and zero, we take all the numbers between zero and 49, and we take 49 itself because that's the, the real edge case we're interested in. And similarly, if when it's 50 or more, we take 50, which is the number we're really interested in, a few numbers beyond that, 100 random numbers up to the maximum number, and the maximum number itself. And with that, we've just got two tests that really capture the requirements for this function. We don't have any arbitrarily chosen random numbers, and we've ended up with two tests, which is right, because in this toy example, our function splits the integers into two halves, above 50 and below 50, and our tests reflect that very nicely. So we've added in unit tests uh, using these nice generators. And the last thing I wanted to do with my team uh, was to go through the idea of using test doubles. Historically, C++ has lagged behind other languages with support for these, but there have been some good improvements in recent years. I wanted to show that to my team. So I gave my team a new requirement that there should be some logging if something went wrong. 
say, if increment quality was called when the item already had a quality above 50. By itself, this is not too difficult, and it lends itself quite well to approval testing. If we run the application or if we call update quality from a test, then it should produce a log, and we can store that as an approved golden master. So first, we want to make sure that we have a logger that works. So here is a simple test that the update quality method produces a log. And uh, this will then be captured with the approval test. And if anything changes in the future, then that will be caught by this test. It's this last line here that does the assert uh, where you verify an existing file. All we're doing is creating a logger and passing it in to our function and then repeating our loop for 30 days. <clears throat> so we can start to make the tests pass by modifying your update quality method. Uh, this now takes in a logger um, and it logs something. It logs updating quality at the beginning. And then we forward on the logger to other functions that might want to use it. The tests don't pass yet because we don't actually have a logger. So let's make one. Uh, this is the interface for it. Um, it's just a virtual function that takes in a string um, and returns nothing. And then this is a definition of a concrete implementation. Um, this is a wrapper around a C++ library called speedlog, which you can see down here. And the interesting bit really is just this log method now, which is overriding the virtual one. It takes in a string and just forwards it onto speedlogger. That's all it does. The rest of it's just boilerplate, really. Um, and our tests now compile and run. Um, and the first time we run it, obviously, we get win merge up as expected. We can copy this output across to here uh, and proving and committed. But if we rerun it to make sure it passes, it doesn't. It fails because the new output doesn't match the old output. The time subtly differs for each run. And it will be different every time um, because time keeps moving forwards. And we're including the time in our log, which is what you want in a log, but it's not what you want in a test. The output will never, ever be consistent. We have inconsistent output given consistent inputs. But approval testing relies on having consistent output. But luckily, the approval test framework has thought of this. Um, in C++, we just need to create this options object here. Um, I've got a little function called munger, which is designed to munge the date and time. Uh, this is just the regex for finding the date and time. And basically, going to find one, something that matches this and replace it with munged date time. Um, and it'll work on any log file. Using it's really easy. When we call verify existing log file, we simply pass in the thing returned by Munger. And now when we run it, the date and time gets replaced with this munged date time. This is purely a change in the test framework. Um, the logger itself is still logging date and time. But our tests now pass. So great. Having a logger is all very well. But when we run unit tests, we never want to write a file. File IO is very slow, and we really want our unit test to be super fast. It's OK for the approval tests to write a file because they haven't got any other choice. But if we can keep them separate, then we can still have very fast unit tests. But we also want to be able to test that our functions are writing to the log when they should and not writing to the log when they shouldn't. And we also want any test that is using code with the logging still runs very fast. This is where mocks and stubs can help us. We'll look at uh, stubs first. This is Martin Fowler's definition. Stubs provide canned answers to calls made during the test, usually not responding at all to anything outside what's programmed in for the test. So in our case, in our unit test, we want a logger that does nothing when it's asked to log. So if we have a unit test which tests that increment in the quality above 50 does nothing, it, should, it, it might try and log, but it should not try and write to file. So here is our stub logger. It implements the iLogger interface and implements the log function. And this here is the body of the function. It does nothing. Great, that's a perfect stub. <clears throat> and if we use this logger in our tests, whenever something asks to log, the logger will just ignore the request. So here we have our increment quality and we're testing it. I'm going to test increment quality. We have a little helper function here that creates a stub logger and passes that into increment quality. So anything in here that tries to log will just um, fall on deaf ears. The unit test will carry on running very, very quickly with no actual writing to file. Great, so now we have some unit tests that are executing code that tries to log, but the call never tries to write to file. But what do we do if we want to know that something was logged? This is where mocks come in. Uh, again, here's Martin Fowler's definition. Mocks are pre-programmed with expectations which form a specification of the calls they're expected to receive. They can throw an exception, if they receive a call they don't expect, and a check-in verification to ensure they got all of the calls they were expecting. 
In other words, we can set expectations on a mock, such as log should be called, and then we can assert that this expectation was met. And we can also set an expectation such as log should not be called and assert on this too. To do this, it's really useful to have a mocking framework. Mocking frameworks allow us to create mocks very quickly without loads of boilerplate. So when I ran this with my team, we used a C++ library from Bjorn Fahler called Tromploy, which is very nice. With this framework, it's trivial to create a mock logger. Uh, here it is here. Um, we have another implementation of iLogger, and we tell the mocking framework that we are mocking a function that takes one parameter, um, it returns nothing, it takes in a string, and it's overriding the function. The function itself is called log. So now we can write tests with expectations. These can be confusing if you're used to the normal pattern of unit tests. Normally, as I said earlier, we arrange, act, and then assert. But with mocking tests, you set the requirements for the expectations at the beginning. The definition of the assert comes before the action. Uh, here we have a require. Uh, so we're saying we require logger um, to have its log method called with any string. Um, we could go further and have exactly which string we expect to be put here, but maybe that's too strict a requirement. Uh, we don't want this test to fail just because somebody rewords the output slightly. And then when this um, mock logger goes out of scope at this point here, the check will come in to make sure that um, we did indeed have a call to log. And we can write a similar test that nothing is logged if the quality is not too excessive. So here we have a forbid call. So now we're saying there must never be any calls to the log method on logger. <clears throat> um, this test will fail if any code in here does call log. The, um, what the mock thing will here will actually throw an exception at that point. Um, these tests now both pass, and with that, we are done. We can test that logging happens without having to actually do any file I.O. All these tests are very fast, but I hope uh, also very expressive. So that's the end of my deep dive into the Gilded Rose. Uh, we have looked at catters and the idea of taking the time to improve your skills. We did this whole investigation into the Gilded Rose by taking time out from our work and investing in some learning. If you take time out of your work to improve and get faster, then you'll achieve more in the long run. And it's really important that you do this in work time. If you expect people to practice in their spare time or at home, then you're punishing people with kids, people who care for others, people who just need downtime to recover from their day job. This has to be done in work time. We looked at how to use approval testing to bring a legacy system under test coverage, how to verify that this has been successful using a code coverage tool, and how quickly you can do that. We looked at how to go about refactoring and adding nice clean tests and how to create expressive unit tests. And finally, we looked at how to use mocks and stubs to allow tests to work with slow subsystems. I hope that you will go on to take some time out and practice some of these cutters for yourself. They're good fun and they're a great way of trying out new things safely. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Barney. It was really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I double down on what you said. Um, Practicing these skills doesn't mean you need to take on your personal time at home uh, and your personal life. Many people cannot afford to do that. Uh, I usually say that the comp your company uh, probably has a budget to train you. Uh, they, they need to train you. They need to spend that budget. And so practicing these kind of things can be part of, of this uh, yearly training. And uh, yeah, uh, we're doing something similar at work. Uh, we, we spend some time uh, following that kind of um, courses on legacy code or practicing katas also we do, we do tech workshops. Um, and yeah, do, doing that on the work time is something we should not neglect. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at the, the questions. So uh, remember people, if you have any question you want to ask Barney, you have a ask a question uh, link on the, on the bottom of this stream. Uh, you can vote for existing questions or add new questions. Uh, I'm going to read the first question that has been voted. Um, so why did you want to add a comprehensive unit test uh, as you already had a comprehensive approval test? Good question. Um, mainly because the approval test is, we don't really know what it's doing. 
uh, we're passing in some values that we found um, that just happen to be lying around. Um, obviously, in this case, it's a very small example. Um, but in the real world, you'd be testing a small part of your system by doing that. Um, what you really want to have in any system is unit tests. Um, but the other reason is also speed. Unit tests will run much faster than approval tests. And if you can get comprehensive unit tests in, then they should be running much faster. But it was really just to practice the idea that unit testing is what you really want to dig deep into the details of how things work, whereas approval testing is more of a sort of outside in test. It's testing the full system. Thanks. Yes, I, I think that answered the question. If you have a follow up question, don't hesitate to, uh, to iterate on that. Uh, for the moment, there is no more question. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, so will you share the link of, you mentioned Sandy Metz also presentation on, on this? Uh, yes, is that not on my... Um, oh yeah, it, uh, yes, it is here. Oh, okay. it's the, oh yes, yes, the third one from the bottom. Link. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yep. the slides will be available afterwards, uh, don't worry. Uh, yes, you have a different, a different um, presentation on this same exercise, but it will be this time done by Sandy Metz. Yes, very good. Uh, which is <laughs> Her really solution good is very, very elegant indeed. Yeah, it's very, uh, well, it's Ruby, but it's very object-oriented flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, yeah, it's an elegant approach. I, yes. I really like this one too. Okay, do we have any other questions? Not yet. Okay, well, I think that's fine. So, uh, yeah, if there is no more question, thank you very much, Barney, for uh, being here, uh, delivering this talk. Everyone, uh, we will take a 15 minute break. And uh, after that, we will have Emily, uh, who was in the audience, uh, who will uh, iterate on that and, and talk uh, deeper about approval testing. So see you in a few.